It's a very warm welcome to the webinar on designing great learning programs. I'm Mark Francis, the Learning Director at the Star Commercial Academy, part of the Aspire Group. Let me say right from the start, if everyone who is on this webinar can mute your screen so that it makes for a much smoother experience and a much better recording of the webinar beyond. There's one other thing I'd love you to do is look at the chat um, box and where you have any questions of our panelists today, please do send that question on the chat format link and we'll have a session of question answering towards the end of the webinar. Our aim and purpose in the next 44 minutes is to energize you to create a learning journey which transforms behavior. So that's the purpose of what we're trying to do. And in that time, we're going to share experiences of doing this from the world of the arts, psychology, sport, education, and business. Just to say who we are as the Aspire Group and what we do, we are a group of very passionate people who love to energize people to transform their businesses. And we call this method champion-led change. And what's wonderful is I know I've got a number of champions on our various programs around the world who are listening in to the webinar, and I'd like to say a very warm welcome to you. I would as well love to introduce our two panelists. Samantha Ward is an occupational psychologist and hello, Samantha. Hello there. Lovely to have you on board. I'll come back to you in just a second because I'd also like to say a, a warm hello to Lewis Parsons. Hi there. Great to have you on board, Lewis. So, Samantha, uh, my first question has to be on behalf of everyone listening in. Occupational psychologist, I'd love to know the purpose of that role and indeed some of the things that you do in that role. Really good question. So occupational psychologists work in business, helping to improve the effectiveness of organizations through their people. So um, it's quite a broad remit, but my specialism is working in leadership effectiveness. So I get involved in uh, the whole performance management cycle from recruiting the right people into the role, all the way through to development, coaching, retention, making sure that the high potentials in an organization are kept and supported in helping their, in achieving their potential. Um, and obviously, of course, I get involved in a lot of training as well. So great, you're just the sort of person we need to get a perspective on some of the things that make learning programs, training programs stand out. So Samantha, I'd love to ask you then, um, in terms of the world that we have today beyond businesses, many of the leaders that we see that should be role models, quite frankly and obviously, are not role model leaders. How do you help people who don't have role model leaders within their organizations to step up and lead? Well, it's about inspiring and motivating people. It's about giving them very clear objectives and then supporting them to achieve those objectives. So to make sure you've got the right people in the organization, who are all working towards the interests of the organization. So they're not in it for their own egos or their own necessarily for their own uh, agendas, but they're all committed to working towards the broad interest of the business. So therefore the business needs to have very clear objectives, very clear strategy. And then it's supporting them, supporting them to get there, uh, especially if there's an absence of strong leadership. Lewis, let me come back to you. And in that context, you're a, a professional artist, you're an entrepreneur, and you are an educator. Uh, why do you do that, and what do you do? I believe in the, the power of art to uh, transform how people see themselves and, and see their organisations. And I'm truly passionate about our ability to preempt the future, see the future, and I'll either create art inspired by leaders and visionaries, uh, visions of the future, translate that into an all on canvas painting, or I enable organizations to also create their own art um, inspired by the future too. And um, one example of that was recently ended up working with 320 staff in 
Microsoft where they were rebranding the charter and mission and um, uh, imagine 320 people all painting at the same time capturing something of their image of the future it was a it was a, a visceral a visceral experiential learning um, piece of work and one that really stands out in mind it was a real joy to be part of that's great and and what's interesting is that's a perspective on how do you create a learning program for large audiences and indeed one-to-one, -one. and I know Lewis and you, Samantha, work one-to-one -one as well as in groups. So we can bring some of that broader perspective to the discussion today, and it, it'll be great to hear from you. The other thing I'd love to share is that, Lewis, I've, I've been a trainee on one of your programs, a, a program called Vision Scaping. How did you make that such a, a, a broad learning experience, a blended learning experience? Give us some of the headlines you use. So I think the key thing is to um, is to make make people not just think differently but feel differently. So to actually um, get people engaging and on their feet as soon as possible in a way that's outside of their current realms of thinking is it can be a little bit uncomfortable, but then it can be really exciting and engaging. So uh, one example is to uh, you know, asking people if they've ever been to an artist's private view because people think they know what art is and what happens at a private view. What's rare is actually to get people to really look at a painting and then ask them what they see and feel and experience. And um, that's one way that you can turn something that's a fairly ordinary thing into something just a little bit more extraordinary by asking a couple of questions and being genuinely fascinated but what they've got to say and share uh, with one another. Thank you, thanks very much. Uh, the two things we're gonna do on this webinar and, and Lewis and Samantha will help bring richness to these two things. We're gonna share the science of great learning programs, the structure of a, a learning program so that you can be aware as designers of how to do it. But we're also gonna share the art what are the skills within the steps of a great learning journey? So we'll share those two things and ask Lewis and Samantha to build on them for us. So I'd like to start with the premise of one of the things we love to break in terms of the way people currently design a learning program. And it's frankly that you go on a workshop or a, a training program and basically you sit and listen to some expert preacher teacher do all the talking, when in fact, great learning sessions are all about experiencing the new way of thinking or feeling as you describe it, Lewis. So most of the time should be spent with trainees practicing. And so the science has traditionally four key steps. Explain the learning point, demonstrate the learning point, allow a lot of experiential practice and feedback, and then have some element of review and consolidate learning. Samantha, I'd love to get your perspective on this learning cycle in terms of how do people approach learning, particularly in the point of, hmm, I'm a little bit nervous of stepping outside my comfort zone. That's a really good question. Um, it's, it's critically important that we create a safe environment. So if we want to introduce uh, different vehicles to enable learning, for example, role plays, presentations, exploring case studies, group discussions, that sort of thing, we need to make absolutely sure that the environment is safe. So you would contract up front. Guys, this is a training session. It's confidential. Uh, it's a safe space for you to explore the learning. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to play around with what you're learning uh, and feedback will be given in a constructive way. We're going to be leaving our judgments at the door. So, for example, uh, I ran a training course recently, which was uh, upskilling um, senior managers to coach their teams. And within that, uh, there was I built in a, a piece which involved role playing, which helps to upskill people and also helps them to rehearse and consolidate the new information. And I introduced it in the afternoon after everybody had a chance to get to know each other, to have some fun, to relax into the learning session uh, and, and, and then felt confident and brave enough 
to start role playing in front of the, the, you know, their peers in the room. Thank you. And, and what I'm hearing then is this first step of the science of explain includes set the scene, create the right environment, might well and should include pre-communication to the delegates of what to expect, why not to be concerned about what might happen on the day itself if that's an intervention that is face to face. So explain is not just the learning point, it's clarify the purpose, the intent, and some of the outcomes right up front. In terms of the wider experience, Samantha, of learning, yeah. what are the essential ingredients of that experience once you've done the environment creation? What are the other elements that make up great learning? Well, for me, there are two things that are critical. The very first thing, it sounds simple, but people get it wrong, is having a clear business need. What is the business need? Because your learning objectives will hang off this. And also, cru crucially, you will invariably need to get key stakeholders to buy into the business investment. So you need to be able to justify why you are running a training course, why you are investing a considerable, usually considerable resource in it. So having a very clear business need and, a very, and very clear learning objectives. You can have more than one learning objective. Try not to make too many of them, but keep them specific, keep them measurable, keep them achievable, keep them realistic, and also make sure they're time bound as well, so that you know by when the learning should have been established. So the, there's, there's um, an algorithm, which I'm sure everyone will be familiar with, called SMART. If you use the SMART principle, when you're designing your learning objectives, then you won't go wrong. And, from, and, the second, and the second critical piece when you're designing a training course is thinking about your delegates. Who are the people that are going to be sitting there learning? What are their capabilities? Pitch the complexity and the, and the usefulness of the material. What, what are they bringing into the room? Remember that they're adults. And so you need to follow the principles of self-directed learning. Make sure, like we said earlier, that they feel safe. Don't ask them to take risks too early. Respect their experience. They will be bringing experience and knowledge into the room. Use that as a resource to help you uh, convey what you're trying to teach them, to help you build on it. Um, also remember that they're not passive. They need to be active in the learning experience. So try and build in as much latitude as possible for them to get involved. So there's two key things there. One is very clear objective. The second is know your audience. That's great. Lewis, I'm going to come to you because I'd love to build on this idea of smart objective. How do you weave in a, what I would call a softer objective, which is around building confidence, building trust in both the trainer and the learning journey? So it's a much softer objective. How do you do that within your programs? So in my mind, I'm coming back to this idea that you're helping people unlock this fear of uh, doing art or painting. How do you set an objective that's less, less hard and sharp? Right. So um, I think one of the main things is, uh, especially when it comes to artwork and sitting in front of a, a blank canvas, there seems to be that sensation more than most sensations, which will generate a feeling very quickly it'll either be fear anxiety you know worry or it'll be excitement and a sense of wow i can't wait to start so to accommodate what what's um, occurring in people i will notice that straight away as soon as people walk into a room i'll ask them okay so i notice the looks on certain people's faces I notice the looks on other people's faces and it always makes me smile to notice what that variance is and just to acknowledge right how are you feeling what how, how could that why would why could that be and to acknowledge that actually that's all part of something known as creative tension the moment we're faced with the unknown this creative tension exists and um then the the, the next piece is then as i'm teaching some of the techniques to paint in a very quick fire fashion because a lot of people are worried about creating art because you know they haven't done it since they're five years old they're worried about how they're going to look and connecting that to leadership you know there has to be a sense of fearlessness in the face of wondering what other people are going to think about you and a sense of vulnerability 
So to actually then um, acknowledge that what you're about to do when you place the paint on the canvas, you are almost certainly going to make what's known as mistakes. And the first rule I, I say is that it's actually it's completely impossible for you right now to make a mistake. But what can happen is there are a series of happy accidents. But those happy accidents within this framework, within this uh, environment, as we were saying before, it's similar to that idea of setting an environment where it's completely safe for people to operate. It becomes really fun because you're making what feels like a mistake and turning it into something that you want it to become. So there's the acknowledgement of the freedom to it kind of express things within you. And it, 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 it really is, um, it's not, it's not therapy, but it's, it's deeply therapeutic and it's very engaging to express um, from, this, from this place of, uh, of being. See, wonderfully, I've, I've experienced that. And I, I'm going to draw the attention of anyone watching the visual of the learning cycle that this is the demonstrate show element where Lewis, in this case, as the expert, demonstrated how to use um, a paint on a palette. And to an extent, there was a real nervous tension in the audience, including me, thinking, oh, my goodness, the expert is so good. Perhaps I can't begin to achieve any of that skill set. And it was hugely reassuring, Lewis, when you said mistakes are part of the learning and it's part of the joy and it's impossible to fail. Those sort of messages were really enabling for me as a, as a delegate of yours. So uh, very, very prevalent to what you just said. That's what I think is one of the most releasing and enjoying things is, is when you actually connect with something you personally believe in and you take steps to make that a reality then there is that similar sense of creative tension. It's similar, you know, the spirit of creativity is very akin to the spirit of entrepreneurship, which is you notice something, you just have a sense that you're going to go in that direction as a leader, I'm going to go after it. Um, inevitably, you can't really see your next steps as mistakes. Otherwise, you'll just shut yourself down. You have to deal with that little inner voice and keep moving and adapting to that environment. And eventually you come out, it's like a good conversation you end up in a place that probably wasn't exactly where you decided to be, but it was a thrilling experience, it took you to the edge of your comfort zone, made you feel alive, and you end up creating either a product, a service, a learning experience that was enjoyable and co-created with those in the room too. Thank you, and, and Samantha, I'm gonna come back to you on this because Lewis talks about creative tension, mm. and I'd love to know from you as, as, as the psychologist, how do we get the balance right between stretching someone outside of their comfort zone and not stressing them? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, obviously it's important to know your audience first and foremost. Be aware of what they might be bringing into the room and make allowances for that. Maybe ask them to talk about their fears, get them to check in periodically throughout the day. How are you feeling right now? As Lewis said, Try and get the feelings out, get the feelings out onto the table. Often with training courses, we're in our heads. We're disconnected from what's going on inside our bodies. We're disconnected from our emotions. We're very cerebral, we're very analytical. And so create space throughout the day to just stop, check in. How's everyone feeling? How's it going? Just be a bit sort of relaxed, a bit more relaxed. Move away from the, from the training material. That's great. And one, one insight that's striking me from listening is that there's a huge role to play here, not in the design of the course itself, but in the skill of the facilitator during the learning. Mm. The awareness of audience, the awareness of reaction, the allowance of space, which you talk about, Samantha, to, to allow people to reflect and consider and be themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the trainer or the facilitator needs to be quite nimble, but also needs to be emotionally aware and insightful, needs to read what's going on in the faces of the people in front of them. Maybe move around the room, maybe have conversations. If it feels tense, then maybe get people to pair off because sometimes people can be quite overwhelmed by being in a large group situation. Um, but yes, absolutely. It's about using your emotional intelligence as a trainer 
to, to tune into what's going on in the room because one of the main blocks to learning is anxiety. Thank you. And I'm going to just um, allude to the fact that uh, visually the, the screen I've put up here has the word practice in a bigger box and consolidate in a bigger box than the first two. Very deliberately, because we see a strong requirement for genuine learning to be through the practice. You called it role play earlier, Samantha. Mm. I sometimes use the term real play to try and make it less um, disconnected to my daily job. But the percentages here are very clear and strong that if we can make most of the learning experiential with feedback, that will have a more dynamic impact on my ability to apply learning beyond the event. Is that something you can build on, Samantha? Absolutely. Um, if we talk a bit more about the science of how we learn, at a very crude level, um, we transfer information from our short-term memory over to our long-term memory through repetition. But that only works with factual information, chunking of facts or numbers. If you want to remember a telephone number, for example, you rehearse it and eventually it, it gets stored in your long-term memory. But what about when you need a shift in attitude or a shift in habits? Uh, because training courses aren't just about upskilling. They're also about changing knowledge and changing attitude. So people will come into the room carrying habits of mind and points of view, inevitably. And these can be the key blocks to taking on new information. So if you think about training as not just a transfer of information, but a transformation of information, because what we do is we take in information and we transform it by reconstructing it to fit in with our own schemas, they're called in the trade, basically our own existing mindsets that we bring to bear on everything. And so in order to transform the information, we need these experiential exercises. So hugging is another word for role play uh, in the trade. And it's about simulating an activity or, or real play, as you call it. And what it does is it encourages rehearsal, but it also encourages critiquing and analytical thinking. Because while you're in the moment and you're actually doing this real play or role play, you are thinking, you're analysing it, you're critiquing it, you're critiquing your own behaviour, you're giving yourself a kind of a feedback loop. And then another, a second technique is bridging. So what we want people to do is join the dots between the old information that they have or their existing schemas and the new information. We want to somehow form a creative bridge across the two. And so I would, you know, I, I would encourage the use of things like case studies why don't you bring real life case studies into the training uh, session so that you can work through them you can i don't know for example um i was working with a, a group of uh, senior leaders um who were who are in a strategy meeting and they kept getting stuck how are we going to decide on a new strategy how where are we going to move from here they kept going around the same loop time and time again and so i asked them to go away spend half an hour in pairs thinking about a real life case study that they're experiencing at the moment and bring it back into the session and then start to think about how they might apply the new approach to designing the strategy to this case study and then compare and contrast with the old approach. And so by doing that, what you're doing is you're reflecting, which helps you to consolidate new information because you're attaching it onto your existing structure in your mind, in your brain. Thank you. And just to call out, I've been asking questions from my own brain. I'm delighted we've had six questions already have come in from those who are listening on the webinar. And I'll just remind you, please keep sending questions. We'll have a question and answer session towards the end. One example, actually, you, you inspired in my head, Samantha, with work that I do in sport. And the terminology I use is not role play or real play or hugging. It's actually purposeful practice. Mm. And so one of the things I do with soccer teams when I work with professional soccer teams is we practice penalties in a way to simulate the real experience of a penalty, which is you only get one. And so we have, particularly those teams that have a penalty shootout, we have the penalty takers standing in the middle of the pitch. They have to walk the distance that they would in the real situation to the penalty spot. And they're only allowed to practice once. And it is much more purposeful and real than if you just take 10 or 12 in a row. 
because in the real situation, you have a pressure of a one-off hit. So I call it purposeful practice. So Lewis, coming to this lovely point about practicing, I'm, I'm going to move on to the art of designing a great learning program and quite naturally come to you in this. And I've got a, four elements to the arts, and I'm sure there's more than four elements. But can you start us off by just sharing from your perspective how you get your participants and learners to be fully in, embraced into that learning, to, to dive into the experience? How do you do that? Um, so from the first moment that people step into the room, uh, is, is really the first moment that we engage in a, a very clear seven-step framework in, in my mind. So um, it, it's strange to me that a, a lot of um, classical kind of art workshops focus very heavily on showing theory of colours and how to paint a tree or a horse or something like that, for example, which, I don't know about you, kind of puts the fear of God into me because then immediately you have to compare yourself to something exterior. Um, so instead, what I've learned over the years from painting is it's so much more powerful to start from within, to start with your inspiration. What is it that drives you? What is it that really fires you up and lights you up? And of course, similarly, that's true for, for leaders and especially starting up a, uh, maybe a new program or a new leadership team will bring someone new on board. There's a sense of new engagement and excitement. So um from the moment people step into the room it seems like people uh, you're you're being asked to reflect on artwork for example and then you're asked to reflect on a moment when you feel truly alive and engaged because those are the most precious moments that that stand out for us and they're very akin to the type of energy that we need to show up because it takes such energy to transform especially these days in the face of so much distraction um so I've actually structured the process to be how I see the creative process itself, which is similarly to how you've structured the, the learning sequence. Um, it's full immersion. Every step is an experience with a tiny bit of explaining why we're doing what we're doing um, from um, actually meditating, not meditating so much as visualizing that moment, just like an athlete will visualize moments of victory in the past so too we are a treasure trove of, of moments of victory in the past um, so that's the first step is to get people to really think quite deeply about that um, and to overcome those inhibitions that might come from actually just taking two or three moments for yourself to think and feel and re-experience times in the past that have been so successful uh, to you then I ask people to share what those moments are with one another. And that in itself is a great leveling experience because to hear these moments of aliveness from one another, and again, they can be from your personal life as well. There are personal moments of achievement in life, which once you hear a trusted peer and colleague sharing that with you, utterly transforms the view you have of them and they have of you. And you can't stop those conversations. It's, it's a, it's a, a moment where it feels like you can actually bring more of yourself to work, more of your engagement to work, more of who you are to work. Um, so there's this very simple way of coaching one another about, well, so what did that experience look like to you? What did it feel like? So again, these just like feel like simple structured steps. They feel like, for example, an icebreaker, but it isn't. It's the first step of reflection. Or it feels like a now we're going to group up into pairs coaching moment. But actually, that's step two of the uh, creative process is to, is to nurture that moment of inspiration and start to prototype it in a way, start to experiment with it, share it with someone else, uh, see how they respond to it and react to it. It becomes more vivid and alive. And then I'll turn around to the audience and say, right, you've actually done 80% of your creating. What we're now going to do is just translate what it is you shared with one another into a very simple painting. Um, and I'll show, actually show the painting techniques in about two minutes. It's so fast that it doesn't actually matter in a way what the uh, painting is in a sense that, that's created. You can't get too hung up on that final piece. It's more about the experience of 
translating an inner uh, feeling or emotion uh, or a moment of uh, vision that you believe in powerfully and translating that into a, an external object is, a, is an extremely powerful experience because, again, that's what we're seeking to do as leaders and entrepreneurs and team leaders is to see a possibility and bring it into reality. Um, so although they feel like a structured kind of um, sequence of workshop moments, they're actually completely aligned with, with the creative process and how we set about um, creating anything in our lives, really, whether it's a moment with our son or our daughter or our wife, you know, to have a moment of presence with them or whether it's to even, um, you know, bring, bring a, a moment of higher profitability through your sales team. What does that look like? What does that feel like? How are you going to engage with people differently so they feel that emotion? Um, yeah, so uh, making it as experiential as possible um, is, is the key for me in that. Thank you. And uh, on the screen are, are four words that I'd like to bring to life a bit more target, unlearn, blended learning, and how to embed behavior. And inspired by your, your input about connecting with people's feelings, Lewis, I'm reminded of a, of a piece of work we've, we've done with one of our clients on presenting with impact. And as a result of the program, one of the delegates, a, a, an amazing lady called Bo Jakobenko, who is a marketing leader in their business, who had been on the program presenting with impact and had entered the young marketing leader of the year award, quite a prestigious award for marketers. And she spoke to me and said, can you help me? Because I've got to do a final presentation to this pretty senior board. And I said, well, what's your aspiration here? What's the target? And she said, well, I wouldn't mind winning the award. It'd be quite nice. And I said, that's the business target. That's the tasky target. But how do you want to feel? How do you want to feel when you're standing up in front of well-known marketers who are judging you? And she said, I want to feel confident and relaxed. And I said, okay, that's a legitimate target too. Let's be conscious that it's not just about the hard target here. It's the soft benefit. It's the greater confidence. It's the feeling at ease when I'm doing the thing that is important or indeed otherwise stress creating. I actually feel alive to use your language, Lewis. So that's what we mean by broadening the targeting of the learning. Samantha, from your point of view, how, how do you advise us to create learning objectives that are more than just business objectives, they're also inspirational? Yes, yeah, so when I'm coaching, I will often ask, what is the shift that you want to take place? And I will try and do it during the coaching session. So very often what I find or, or, or in the field of psychology is a lot of work on the sorts of things that derail leaders, um, the dark side of human nature that usually come from habits that were served us well when we were growing up, but now seem to derail us, block us. So the, the, the sort of my mantra is what got you to this point, what got you to here is not necessarily going to get you to there. So we will start to talk about patterns and habits that people have relied on over their lives that just seem to now be causing them to derail, uh, that are, are causing relation, business relationships to go off the boil, that are causing them to make the wrong, the wrong decisions, uh, that are causing them to lose motivation. And so what we try and do is bring it to life. What are these patterns? What are these habits? And what is the shift going to look like? Okay. So beautifully, Samantha, the, the next word up here is unlearn. And if I come back to Bo, uh, the marketing leader that we were talking about, one of the things that she consciously wanted to unlearn and had to was the, the use of PowerPoint slides that I've got a big presentation, therefore I've got to talk to and talk at a number of PowerPoint slides. And actually, we, we decided that was old behavior and probably all the other finalists were going to use that same method. And so very courageously, we dumped that old behavior and uh, decided to just be a storyteller and not have any PowerPoint slides. So that's absolutely to your point, Samantha. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if we, at, at a very crude level, if we divide people into two groups, if you give one group a goal 
they're likely to be inspired to reach their goals. So it's quite easy to paint a vision for them and if it will galvanize them, it will, they will move towards it. But imagine the other camp. These are people that have grown up who have, have achieved what they want to achieve by moving away from risk, by fear of failure. And so when you are coaching or training or developing people, you really need to cater for those two different styles create a vision, create a goal, but also talk about the risks, the downfalls of not adapting this new behavior, because that will speak to a certain group of people who have, who have actually grown up be, being very, very successful because they are moving away from negative uh, consequence as opposed to moving towards positive aspiration. Thank you. And, and let's come on now to blended. And this is a term that people will have heard of. So it's important just to call out what exactly does it mean? It means a balance of online and face to face as part of your learning design. So, uh, for example, in this presenting with impact program that we we run so successfully, we we use a film online in advance to demonstrate the learning. We use a, a guide book to be read in advance. And we also have a post event app. So there's that blend of online and face-to-face -face practice. Lewis, um, what is the way in which you get uh, multiple or multifarious uh, means to get your message across? Yes, yeah, so um, the first is to have um, a clear framework uh, shown on a, on, a, uh, on a screen of some kind, because as weird as that sounds and as, as stayed and readily used as that sounds actually within the context of seeing artwork it's it's kind of satisfying to the mind to know that art can be structured or there can be a structured sequence as it relates to art so i'll have a screen um i'll have physical artwork in a room um we'll have um sometimes we'll have a a pdf that's sent out to prepare people um about actually going through the process once themselves other times it's and and ninety percent of the time it's actually a complete surprise when people walk into the room because that ensures everyone turns up <laughs> and it's also quite nice to see the shock on and all on people's faces as they walk into a room that looks like it's set up like a studio um it definitely has a wow factor and it gets people you know thinking in that different way um and then um it, it's as simple as you know having uh, pens and paper on 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 the tables so that once people have had an experience they they write it down physically writing down has been shown to have um rather than typing things has been shown to actually help embed learning a lot more effectively than typing things onto a screen so actually in providing people with uh, specialized journals um to to write down what their their moments of achievement have been is uh, is very powerful i keep a journal every day um so yeah between some of the standard modes of communication obviously your physical presence in the room uh is is another way um and then there are other ways in following up to have an audio file to actually so on a daily basis you can actually have a a, a two or three minute visualization of this is who i am and this is how i'm going to show up today as it relates to um the the painting that you've created so the learning can then be repeated beyond that day um both as you and in, in, as an individual and as a, as a team so i'm trying to tap into all of those modalities the the textual feeling of painting the visual element of create of, of, of seeing your vision writing down what your vision is um, it really comes in at all those different angles and physically talking about it one another as well Thank you. We're coming to the last five minutes of the webinar, so I am going to bring in a couple of questions that we've, we've had sent in. And actually, one of them's on it, how do you embed learning? So this is a question that was asked of Samantha, and it's a high gain question for those who know what that is. What is the one thing you would advise me as a designer of a learning program to do to ensure that behaviors and skills learnt on an event or a training course are embedded into the habits of the learner beyond the event itself so great question 
obviously the first step is to make sure that your your training design caters for all the different styles that are going to be in the room so probably most of your audience will be familiar with the myers-briggs uh, personality type so within that you have your extroverts your introverts you're sensing the people that like detail, your ends, your big pictures, your um, thinking types are like rational, like the evidence, uh, and your feeling types, you need to play to their values when you're teaching them. So if all of your material and your, 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 your training material speaks to all of those different types through, as Lewis was saying, you know, different modes, quizzes, case studies, exercises, presentations, role plays, fish bowls, triads, all these things will cater for a room of very diverse people. So that's the first thing that will help to embed the, the learning in the short term. But then afterwards, it's about creating opportunities for people to put their learning into practice. So make sure that the training course is timely run it when you know that the, the, the learning needs to take effect quite quickly. Don't run it a, a, a year before the change needs to happen within the organisation. So try and make sure that learning opportunities afterwards are created. If that's not possible, then half hour webinars, for example, just to refresh, sending out emails with questionnaires, just to try and get people to remember and continue to keep that information fresh until they need to to learn and apply it. And then finally, when they are uh, applying it in day-to-day -day life, make sure that their managers are watching them where possible, observing them and giving them feedback, just to make sure that the learning stays crisp and relevant. Because as I said earlier, often what we do is we transform material. And so often we might take it away and like Chinese whisper, we may end up um, six months down the line going off on a tangent a bit. So. That, that, you know, creating our own meaning out of the learning. So make sure that the managers and the team leaders are observing uh, the learning and giving feedback and shaping it. Thank you. So we're now coming into the, the classic, the, the final straight of this webinar. So I'm going to ask questions and look for short, sharp answers from my two experts here. Uh, one element that we would strongly recommend about embedding is that you have engaged people as champions to own the learning beyond the event itself. So that's the whole essence of champion led as well. One question I'd love to get an answer to because it came through from one of our listeners was how do you get someone who doesn't really want to be there because they've just been told to turn up? How do you get them engaged in the learning? So what's your top tip, Lewis? You know, I was just looking at the questions and that was the one I'm not quite sure. I've never had to deal with that. I think, God, I really don't know how to answer that question. Normally, people who've been there don't want to be there or without blowing it at any trumpets or anything. I've really enjoyed it by the time they get to the end of it. But my, um, so it's your yeah. own energy. Yeah, maybe. maybe. Resilient. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think you just have to try and blow them away somehow and show them what a what, a, what an incredible opportunity is about to unfold. Are you either going to make the most of it or sit there with your arms folded being super glum? You know what, in which case, you know, it's, it's up to you how you're going to choose to be. But, I'm, you know, I, I refuse to let someone's energy like that, you know, change the, the entire atmosphere of the room. You just got to get on and do, do the best you possibly can for everyone else who do wants to be, does want to be there. Thank you. And Samantha, a different question for you. What's the best way for a trainer and his delegates to connect to create a really effective environment for learning? Nice short answer for me, Samantha. It's about making it a shared, a shared learning experience. So you need to agree what's in it for you and what's in it for them and what you're going to get out of it. Thank you. Collective agreement. Final input from all three of us now is what are your top tips? So it's your final big um, a suggestion on what will make a really big difference as a training designer. So final top tips from me, which are on the screen, are really a summary of what I heard from Lewis and from Samantha. Be clear and explicit. Be visual. Create an environment where people feel free to take risks. And then make sure the consolidation is consistent, rigorous, and also incredibly personable. So that's my top tip. Or top tips, uh, Lewis. What's yours? <laughs> you think you just covered mine. Um, <laughs> be be visual, be visceral, be tangible, be experiential, and then give the moments of ah, this is why we're doing what we're doing, and then back into it. We focus so heavily on the theory. I think it's just bring it bring it back to them 
why they're there and why you're there and just make it make it so exciting that that's what i would say brilliant thank you samantha yeah i would just say engage engage them know who you're talking to know who's in the room and secondly keep it relevant make sure it's relevant to them uh, and understand help them understand what's in it for them thank you and so the big events to think about coming up with the Aspire Network are a leadership event uh, and a presentation skills event. Uh, please look at our website, which is aspire.co.uk for all more information. And here's a little teaser. Anyone who would like to design a session and send it to me via email, I will give you free feedback for improvement and encouragement. And I'd like to offer a huge thank you to Samantha Ward, and to Lewis Parsons for all their input and inspiration on this webinar. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. No, thank you, it's been fun.